Hi, my name is Rachel Landavazo. I'm a physician assistant at the University of New Mexico Hospital and I work with the orthopedic department. And we're here today to discuss total joint replacement. All of the um, slide presentation that we'll be giving is just highlighting important facts that were given in your patient education binder that was handed out. So let's get started. So welcome to your joint journey. Before you schedule surgery, you will need to get medical clearance by your primary care doctor. You'll need to get cardiac or heart clearance by your primary care doctor or your cardiologist, depending on which type you have. Dental clearance by your dentist, and then the total joint class. Your pre-op appointment can be an all-day adventure because there's so many different appointments you need to go to, or um, it can be scheduled different days, so you're just um, here two or three different days, but it's not all day long. You'll meet with your surgeon. He'll review your evaluations from your primary care doctor and your dentist. He'll discuss the surgery with, with you, discuss the risks, the benefits. He may want to out, uh, order some additional labs. You'll also be asked to sign a consent for surgery. You'll be given pre-op instructions. Nothing to eat after midnight before surgery. You'll be asked to shower with a little HIPAA solution that you'll be given at your appointment. They'll also ask females not to shave their legs three days before surgery, and they'll ask men not to shave their facial hair the morning of surgery. Um, the last thing you'll need to do is meet with pre-anesthesia, and that's when you meet with a member of the anesthesiology team, and they talk with you about the risks of surgery because they will be the ones putting you to sleep, and that will be um, responsible for you during the surgery. So they like to get to know you, know your risks, history, physical, any allergies, or any adverse reactions you've had to surgery. So that's all done preoperatively before you come in for surgery. Don't forget to call the business day before your surgery, after 11 a.m., for your surgery time. This is the number that gets you to the OR surgery um, department. They will call you, I would say 95% of the time they will call you. But a lot of times, you know, this is your last kind of day of freedom, I like to say. And you might want to go out to lunch with friends or you have a few errands to run before you come into the hospital. So I like to give you this number to let you know that um, you can call them after lunch and they'll let you know what time you need to be here the morning of your surgery. If you're scheduled for surgery on Monday, you need to call on Friday. No one's here over the weekend, so no one's going to pick up the phone on Sunday to tell you what time to come in. So if your surgery is scheduled for Monday, please, come on, please call them on Friday. So the day of surgery, you go to the second floor surgical waiting room, and you'll check in with, at the desk. There's a little lady that sits at the desk. She's gr really great. She'll check you in, and then she'll call the operating room and let them know that you're here so we all know that we can continue to proceed with our scheduled day. At that time, you'll be taken back to the pre-op holding area. This is where they put the gown on you, give you an IV, get you settled. Um, you'll meet with your anesthesiology. You'll also see your surgeon uh, one last time before surgery. A family member can go with you to this area, and then once they take you back to the operating room, they'll escort your family member back to the surgical waiting room. I always tell people if you have any last-minute questions, this is the time to ask. This is the last time you're going to see your surgeon before you, you go to, into surgery. And you might want to write those questions down. It's Murphy's uh, Law. As soon as a doctor walks into the room, the questions fly out of the room. There they go. So I always give people a little hint and say, why don't you just write them down? And that way you'll have them there in front of you when your surgeon does come in to talk with you. Immediately after surgery, your surgeon will go into the uh, surgical waiting room and meet with your family or friends to discuss how the surgery went. You'll be recovering from surgery in the post-anesthesia care unit. We call it the PACU. Usually you're there for about an hour and a half to two hours. They want to make sure that your pain's controlled, that you're able to drink, that you've kind of woken up and you know where you are and how things are going. After that, once you've recovered, you'll be transferred to 3 South, and that's our orthopedic SAC unit. Once you get up to 3 South, your nurse and tech will greet you and your family and get you um, settled in on the floor. 
They'll give you a little green folder and that has kind of like the menu in it and any important phone calls for the hospital or the floor and kind of just the visitation rules and regulations of 3 South. You will be on IV fluids, so you'll have this pole next to you. And we keep you on IV fluids overnight until you're drinking and eating pretty well on your own. Um, that first day, first night after surgery, you're a little dehydrated and you're not drinking a lot. You're kind of groggy and you're sleeping a little more. So we just want to make sure you don't get dehydrated and keep you on fluids until things are going well. You will also have a catheter in your bladder. It's called a Foley catheter. Um, and it will help you go to the bathroom. So that first night after surgery, you don't have to worry about, uh-oh, it's 2 o'clock in the morning, and I've got to get out of bed, and I just had a major surgery on my joint. This way, you can just not worry about it and just try to sleep and recover because we're going to have a very busy first day. It will be removed the day after surgery. So that catheter stays in your bladder just for that first night, and then it's removed the next morning. So equipment, we'll just go over equipment for the total hips. So the first thing we'll go over are SCDs, and these are sequential compression devices. Basically, anytime you have surgery, you're at a risk for blood clots, and unfortunately, that's just the nature of the beast. Our job is to try to reduce that risk as much as possible. So one way we do that is by putting on these, we call them squeezers here on the floor. Because what they do is they squeeze, they fill up with air and they squeeze your calf. So they're connected to a machine that's at the edge of the bed. You only have to wear these when you're in bed. So when you're, um, normally what you do when you walk, your calf muscles are squeezing and they help circulate the blood throughout your body. And so when you're walking, they squeeze it and then they let go. And so that's kind of what these do and that's why they're nicknamed squeezers on the floor. It's because they fill up with the air and they squeeze and then they relax. So they help the blood circulate in your body to help reduce the risk of blood clots. The next thing we'll talk about are TED hose. And these are anti-emboli stockings. So once again, these are helping to reduce the risk of blood clots. These are the tightest pantyhose you'll ever put on. They're very tight. Your nurses and techs will show you little tricks of the trades on how to put them on. These you'll be wearing for at least two weeks after surgery. And once again, they help keep everything tight and compressed to help the blood uh, circulate and flow throughout your body. Usually you're given two of these, a pair to wear and a pair to wash. You just wash them by hand in soap and water and then lay them flat to dry while you're wearing the other pair. Your surgeon is the one that determines how long you have to wear these. So most of them have you wear them until your follow-up appointment, and then after that it's up to them for how much longer you'll need it. The next thing we'll talk about is a PCA. It's this right here. It's a patient-controlled analgesia. What that means is that you have some control over your pain medication. So you press this button, and this machine will give you pain medication through your IV. You cannot overdose on this. So you can't just keep pressing, pressing, pressing it, and then you won't be given that much medication. It's all computerized. So you're only allowed one dose every 10 minutes. But that usually helps you kind of get over when you're starting to feel it wear off and your nurse hasn't come yet with your other pain medication. You can give yourself a little push, and it'll give you some medication to help you get through. This is usually removed on post-op day one, the day after surgery. Because by that point, you're taking pain medication by mouth, which lasts a lot longer, and you won't really need this anymore. But it's there to help you that first night when if you, you don't want to bother your nurse or your nurse is getting your pain medications, but you're still in a lot of pain, you can press this and it'll help. The next thing we'll talk about is an incentive spirometer. We call this an IS. When you have surgery, it puts you at risk. One of the other risks it puts you at is pneumonia because you're laying flat on your back basically for the whole day and fluid builds up and it likes to collect back here in your lungs. And so what this does is this helps push the fluid out of your lungs back into circulation. So the fluid won't build up and you won't get bacteria and all, um, then it leads up to pneumonia. So I tell people, think of this as the thickest milkshake they've ever had because you're going to be sucking into this. You're not blowing into this. So you blow out 
and then you suck in. Nice, slow and deep because you want to bring the air in down into your lungs and push out that fluid. If I was just to sit here and do it really fast and shallow, that's not going to help. I'm going to get really lightheaded. I might pass out, but I'm not getting the air down into the bases of my lung and pulling, pushing that fluid out. We like people to do this 10 times an hour. So I tell people if they're watching TV, every time a commercial comes on, grab it, take a nice deep suck. There are so many commercials on these days that you'll get more than 10 times an hour, I guarantee it. If you're not a big TV fan and you like to read books instead, I tell people that every, after every second or third page you've read, put the book down, grab your IS, take a deep breath, okay? That also goes home with you until you're back on your feet doing a lot of your activities of daily living. You'll take that home, put it next to your recliner at home that you're going to be sitting in a lot, and just once again, every time a commercial comes on, start taking a little puff on this. The next thing we'll talk about is your abduction pillow. We call this SpongeBob. And what it does is they place it between your legs, like so, and they strap it on with Velcro. And they use this when you're in bed. You don't have to walk around the hospital with this. But what it does is it helps remind you about your posterior hip precautions. So you don't want to cross your leg, or a lot of times when we're asleep, we don't even realize that we cross our legs when we sleep, or we roll over like this, and that would put um, undue pressure on your newly hip, that we don't want that. So this just helps remind you not to cross your legs or any of those other posterior hip precautions that the therapist will go over with you. And the last thing we'll talk about is a trapeze, and I couldn't wheel a hospital bed in here, but for our hips, uh, all of our beds have a little handy helper and it has a little trapeze on it that you can help kind of pull yourself up, adjust yourself and get a little more comfortable in bed. We had to fight with our physical therapist because they didn't like them. They thought we were being too nice to you guys because you don't have a trapeze at home and you have to learn how to get in and out of bed by yourself at home. So they didn't want us to have it here. So we compromised and you get it here for the first day, day and a half. And then when you're starting to do really well, the therapists, they'll take it away. So they are the mean guys and we don't have to be. But they'll take it away and then you'll learn how to get in and out of bed on your own like you would at home. But that first day or two, it's nice to have something to be able to kind of lift yourself up in bed or reposition yourself while you're there. It can also swing over and help you when you're sitting in the chair to get um, repositioned as well. The next thing we'll talk about is anticoagulation therapy. They're blood thinners. Once again, surgery, risk for blood clots. Our job is to minimize, lower that risk as much as possible. And you'll be taught how to give it to yourself or a family member to give it to you before you discharge. So the nurse will teach you, they'll show you a video, and then they'll want to see you or a family member actually give it to yourself before you leave. So post-op day one, the day after surgery, like we talked about, your Foley catheter will be removed. That's the tube that we place in your bladder. Physical therapy and occupational therapy will be in to get you out of bed two times a day. You'll have lunch and dinner in a chair. That first day on post-op day one, we let you have breakfast in bed. That's the only time. After that, all meals are in a chair. You'll be given blood thinners twice a day if you're on the shot, once a day if it's the pill. And then these are drains, so these have to do with knees. Food service. You will need to call food service to order your meals. That does not mean if you forget to call that we won't feed you. It just means that if it's meatloaf Thursday in the hospital, then you'll be getting meatloaf. So we do have a menu and it's given to you when you first come up to 3 South in that little binder we talked about. What we try to say is when breakfast arrives, call for lunch. When lunch arrives, call for dinner. When dinner arrives, call for breakfast. The number from all of the rooms is two food. The nurses and the techs on this floor are wonderful. They will help remind you of all this. There also will not be a test on any of this at the end of this class. Um, these are just things for you to see so that when you see them again, you'll be like, oh yeah, okay, I remember that. Oh yeah, that's what that's for. And it'll just help you um, feel a little more comfortable when you come here for your surgery. So physical therapy and occupational therapy we briefly talked about. You will have PT and OT starting the first day after surgery. 
You will need to participate in therapy each time a therapist enters your room. Our therapists are such on a tight schedule that they don't have time to come back to your room every five minutes to check. Can you go now? Are you ready now? They work really close with our nurses to make sure that you have appropriate pain medication on board so that you're able to work with therapy. So we really work close together on this floor and so we need you to help and participate in your therapy every time they come in. You will have PT and or OT one to two times a day while you're here. And you're really lucky because all of the other floors on the hospital are lucky to get physical therapy once a day. But we've got a priority with our joints because therapy is such an important part of receiving a new joint that we get it twice a day on this floor. So your recovery depends on you and how well you work with physical therapy. Which leads us into pain management. We will not be able to relieve your pain completely. A lot of times people think, oh, I'm getting a new knee, I'm going to be pain free. And we want you to be pain free, absolutely. But we're talking three or six months down the line, you're going to be pain free. You just had a major surgery, you're going to be in pain. And unfortunately, there's no way we can eliminate that. What we try to do, our goal, is to make it manageable for you to complete your activities of daily living. On the floor here, we use a pain scale from zero to 10. Zero is absolutely no pain. Five, it comes and go, we're aware of it. We can still do things, but we're pretty uncomfortable. Most of us are at a five or higher, or we wouldn't be here getting a new joint. 10, it's the worst pain we've ever felt, cannot move. It hurts for people even to walk into your room. We hope for you never to be at a 10 when you're here. Our goal is to obtain a pain score between three and five by post-op day three, and then for it to continue to go away as you continue to recover. We will work together to manage your pain so you can heal. Your pain will be assessed every two hours while you're here in the hospital. No other floor assesses your pain that much. We assess it every two hours because that's how important it is for your road to recovery. So we need you to let us know if you're in pain. We will not be waking you up at two o'clock in the morning to see how your pain is. If you are asleep, we're gonna assume you're at a zero or at a one and you're doing pretty well. We need you to help us help you with your pain. Don't be stoic, please tell your nurses and so we can uh, medicate you appropriately. So be proactive, plan ahead. Who's gonna bring you to the hospital? How are you gonna get home from the hospital? What kind of car will you be going home in? If you have a really high lifted truck after surgery, are you gonna be able to climb all the way up into that truck? You may need to borrow the neighbor's car or someone else's car to help you go home in. So those are things just to start thinking about before you actually come to the hospital for your surgery. Do you have help and assistance at home after your surgery? Ideally, we would love people to have help at home 24-7 for that first week. But we know that's not realistic. A lot of people have to work, they have children to take care of. But the more you can have help at home during that first week of recovery, the better. Do you have a bedroom and a bathroom on the ground floor or on the same floor? Going up and down flights of stairs is very taxing. So if you have to go up and down a flight of stairs every time you have to go to the bathroom, that might be a little too much. So you might need to let the therapist know and they can help you with either getting a bedside commode or something like that so you're not doing that. Going down a flight of stairs in the morning and then staying on that same floor for the whole day and then just having to do the stairs to get back up to your bedroom, that's okay. But having to do it multiple times through the day is very taxing. And is your house walker ready? I never really thought of that before, but walkers are about 21 inches wide. And so if you've been in some of these old homes in Albuquerque, it's really interesting because all of the doors are the same size except for the bathroom doors. They're just a little bit smaller. And it's a little challenging to get a walker in there. I'm not telling you you have to go rebuild your bathroom unless you want to. This would be a good excuse to do it. I'm just saying these are things that you need to be aware of because the physical therapist can help you with the walker, get through tight spaces, get around sharp corners, things like that. 
So things that we don't really think about in our homes now, but now that we're going to be having a surgery and going back to them, these are some of the things just to be aware of. Where will you go after surgery? I would say 85% of our patients go home with home health care. Once again, unfortunately, um, how it is with our society these days is a lot of this is just based on insurance. But a lot of our insurance will cover either home physical therapy or home nursing. The other 15% usually go to a skilled nursing facility. This is not an old folks home. They do not want you to move in. This is a place where you'll get physical therapy, where you'll get some nursing, and you're too good to be here in the acute setting of a hospital, but you're just quite not ready to go home. Usually these places you'll stay at for a week to 10 days at the most. And it's just to kind of get you over that hump until you are safe and ready to go home. A few of our patients may go to acute rehab, but the insurance companies have made such strict guidelines that nowadays just one joint doesn't qualify for rehab. So most of our patients either go home with home health care or a skilled nursing facility. So your post-operative visit. You will be scheduled to see your surgeon 10 to 14 days after your surgery. Your staples will be removed, your incision will be evaluated, and they'll schedule your next appointments. Our surgeons like to follow you for at least up to a year. We've just put a, a joint